Hey there, welcome back to another video. Today we have a 4L60E that's on the bench. And I have kind of an oddity here. Uh, you know, during the course of teardown that for the most part looked unremarkable. I mean, I'll show a couple of things that, uh, you know, may be noteworthy, maybe not. But um, uh, the reason I grabbed the camera is because uh, this is not something I've ever seen before. Now, maybe some of you that do 4L60Es by the thousands per year, you may have uh, run across this, but this transmission was originally featured in my how to purchase a used 4L60E. And if you recall, um, one of the checks that I have you do is, you know, pull on, uh, push and pull on the input shaft uh, to check for end play. And, you know, the main idea there is you want to make sure that there's basically an imperceptible amount of movement. Because uh, on a used transmission, it's going to be very, very hard to feel something like, you know, 15 or 20 thousandths, especially given everything's laden with fluid and, you know, all that good stuff. But uh, this particular transmission had something like a quarter of an inch end play, and I had speculated at the time that it was likely due to the collapse of the um, thrust bearing for uh, the front pump. So anyway, we took it apart. And now here is the thrust bearing, and here is the selective spacer that goes in behind it. And, you know, they sit right here on the drum. And incidentally, uh, I found this um, just like this, and, you know, they, they go like this. But, I mean, that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that I was expecting to find, you know, this bearing here completely destroyed. Uh, you know, just totally collapsed with needle, you know, little needle bearings all over the case or in the pan and whatnot, but I didn't see that. So anyway, I said, okay, that's odd. Um, took the, uh, you know, the two drums out, got them out of the way. I took the snap ring here off of the end of the output shaft. And when I went to grab the front planetary carrier assembly, I realized I, I couldn't do it. They wouldn't come out. Uh, front planet should come out. Okay, I mean this whole assembly up here, uh, ring gear, hub, reaction shaft, uh, planetary carrier, uh, all that should come out. And then sun shells should follow it. But that's not what's happening here. So as you can see, the output shaft is moving with respect to uh, the planet. So it's either welded to the planet or it's seized somehow. Um, I, I have no idea. I have, like I said, I have never seen this before. I have plenty of times seen the 3-4 pack welded here to the 3-4 clutch hub, but I have never seen uh, the planet um, welded to the output shaft quite like this. I mean, I've seen grenaded 4L60Es where everything was more or less welded together. There's pieces of, you know, gear teeth everywhere in the transmission inside the, you know, case in the pan and, and whatever. But um, this transmission is actually fairly clean other than all the burnt clutch materials. So, uh, you know, if you've seen this before, then, you know, maybe you know what to do to get this thing out. But uh, I haven't tried anything real violent yet. Um, my plan is to see if I can get my uh, get my slide hammer in here uh, with an attachment and knowing full well I'm probably going to risk damaging you know the pinion gears but that may not matter at all um, I don't know if this thing's going to rotate inside the ring gear or not yeah I mean the, the pinions are rotating so it seems to be seized or stuck somehow um, to that shaft. And again, I, I've not seen it before. Uh, I mean, I could pound on the shaft here, you know, with like a, a brass punch and a hammer. Uh, I really don't want to do that. I'd really like to see if the shaft can be saved. Um, like I said, I'm probably going to see if I can get a, uh, uh, what do you call it, slide hammer and see if I could separate that planet from the shaft. So let me set that up and I'm going to give it a few whacks and see if, you know, that works at all. See if I can free it up. So stand by. At least I can yank it out real quick just with my hand. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Okay. 
Alright, that, that doesn't look like it's going to work. Alright, so let me see what else I can find. Alright, first I'm going to try um, smacking it out with a brass drift and a hammer. See if that works at all. All right, so it looks like we have a case where maybe the, the rear sun gear is somehow welded to the reaction shaft. The bearing. You can see some you know, clear signs of heat damage, some bluing right in there. Plan itself. Structurally looks okay. These teeth are heavily worn. So, I mean, that would not go back in. And needless to say, this reaction shaft wouldn't be going back in either. Another with that sun gear. This looks like a, a rear lubrication failure uh, driven event. Yep. Nasty. So you see here, uh, who, uh, whoever built this, um, this is a good idea uh, for anything heavy duty, high performance. You always wanna put some uh, channels here, cut some channels at the you know planet side of the sun gear to allow for additional lube flow. Now, obviously that did not help uh, this particular uh, situation out at all, but generally speaking, it's good practice to do that. All right. That's scrap metal. More scrap metal. You know, give a nice close up to the carnage. So, like I said, I haven't really seen 
uh, a situation where only the uh, you know the sun gear is welded up like that. Um, maybe I guess I just haven't done enough of these. I've done you know over I would say over 2,000 at this point, but um, most of the time when this happens, you have like pieces of gear teeth everywhere in the pan. You have um, <clears throat> you know uh, pieces of gear teeth in the case when you're tearing it down. And it's, you know, I don't know. I guess this is just a type of failure mode specifically I haven't seen before. Anyway, um, we can take a look real quick at the uh, stuff in the forward drum. I want to make sure that it's in the shot. So the shop that built this is, a, uh, I think, a fairly well-known builder nationally. Um, you know, this uh, is not a fault of, uh, in the sense that I haven't seen anything so far that leads me to believe that there was some sort of assembly procedural error or you know, some sort of part selection issue that led to what we see here. I think this is just a consequence of um, oil starvation to the gear train. There's a lot of clearance in this clutch pack. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven frictions, six steels and let me go get my um, calipers so it looks like it might be a combination of 4L60 and 4L65E steels or 700R4 steels in here so let's see what the uh, you know what the thicknesses of the steel plates and the frictions are All right, so 80 thousandths, that's 4L60E spec. 4L65E would be a 65 thou steel, or excuse me, 65 thousandths clutch disc. Okay, this is 75 thousandths. So this is 700R4. And, you know, if you already picked up on it, there's a 700R4 apply plate set up in here as well. So 80 thousandths. Seventy-five, seventy-six thousandths. Eighty thou. Seventy-six thou. Eighty thou. They all appear to be the same in terms of uh, frictions and steels. And the frictions don't look burnt or anything. So here we have a, a very, very thin apply plate and our apply ring, or I guess upper ring, not the, uh, not the apply ring that's here at the base of the drum. It's like 188 thou thick. So this appears to be a 4L60 spec backing plate. I'm gonna put this clutch pack back in and we'll take a look and see what kind of clearance we have I mean, I'm not gonna like measure it or anything, but I'm kind of curious, um, and I know I didn't really, really show it, so I'm curious as to why it was set up like this. I mean, it looks like there's better than a hundred thousands of worth of clearance in this in this clutch pack, which is obviously no good. So set this up like this. 
and you know when they went to do the measurements and checked the clearance here I mean, this is if, if they were seeing what I was seeing or what I'm seeing it makes no sense to me as to why I would go out the door like that And I have to pressure test this drum, so I guess that's another reason why I'm reassembling it. I haven't done that yet either. So here's all the clearance that you have in this pack. I mean, that is a lot of clearance. I mean, we like to keep the 3-4 pack to between 35 and 60 thou at most. If you're running a, um, you know, something like a max pack or a power pack, where you have more than uh, six frictions in there, uh, you know, this, the, this is a seven, seven friction, six steel stack up. But, to have that much clearance, you're basically setting the trans up for failure guaranteed. So, I don't know, um, you know, I, I, I have no idea what the builder would have seen when he put this together and when he, you know, um, went to measure for his clearance. But if it's anything like this, uh, you know, you're adding um, other things to that clutch pack to, you know, get within your between 35 and 60 thousandths of an inch clearance. And, you know, the closer you are to that 35 thou mark, the better. Um, some guys will run them down as, as tight as 30 thou. Uh, I know um, Alto in their max pack instructions or some of their instructions, they tell you to run it down to 25 thou or something like that. I never done that. Um, to me, that's a little too tight, but, um, you know, I guess you could do it if you have your high rate return springs and your uh, regular factory, um, uh, what do you call it, um, load release springs installed and your bleeder valve. Because the main thing is you, you just want to prevent centrifugal apply. How you do it is irrelevant as long as you do it. So, anyway, uh, I want to test this drum real quick. So. Let me uh, move the camera a little bit closer and then I'll pour some fluid in there and then we'll put air and see if it's any good or not. All right, I think you have me in a position where you can see what's going on. So what we're gonna do is put some air, uh, starting uh, with the two, three feed, and we're gonna look for bubbles here at the base of the shaft, um, you know, in this area. Uh, if we don't see bubbles, that tells me that at least for the, uh, you know, the third gear apply circuit, the drum is good. And then we'll repeat the process for the forward circuit, which is here, and then the coast clutch, which is back here. All right, so we're looking for bubbles coming up here right around the base of the shaft. And you don't need a ton of air to do this. Now, if you've watched my other videos where you see me do this, I do it in all my teardown inspection videos for these transmissions, as well as I think I have a standalone video. But anyway, if you've not seen it before, this is how you air test the forward drum for um, sealing integrity between the drum and the shaft. Okay, I have about 80 PSI air going in here. Uh, that's really all you need, you don't even need that much. But, as you can see, there's no issues with bubbles. All right, so now we're gonna check the forward feed. So that's gonna be the hole right here. I know you can't see it, but it's the hole right here, and it's between uh, these middle two ceiling rings. All right, now we have the um, coast clutch feed. Anytime you test the coast clutch, you always want to put a finger over the forward feed port, otherwise, you know, a bunch of air will whoosh out of there. Okay. 
Okay, so notice, put air in the coast clutch. I'm gonna let go of the trigger, but air is staying trapped in that circuit until I release my finger. So, you know, finger from the forward drum. So, this drum's actually very healthy. Uh, I was not expecting that at all. I was expecting to see either the shaft kind of moving around such that I can yank it right out of the drum, or, you know, this crown area completely grenaded. Now, um, once we have this apart, we want to very carefully inspect the crown area, both, you know, here as well as inside. And you want to do this after the drum is clean. So I'm actually going to put this drum in the jet wash. And then, um, you know, once it's all cleaned up, we'll do an inspection of it. And we'll see if there's any kind of micro fractures that might be present either on this side or on the underside. Because um, the few comebacks associated with 3-4 failure that I've had all had to do with tiny little cracks that um, I didn't catch. And when it went out the door, those cracks just got progressively worse. And then, you know, you started to have bleed through. And so fluid was hemorrhaging into the case. And then, of course, the three, four pack burns up. Or if it just completely fails, the pack won't burn up, but you'll have zero applied pressure whatsoever. And the net result is the same, a neutral condition in third and fourth gear in drive and a neutral condition in third in drive three. So anyway, um, uh, that's the situation uh, with this so far. Uh, let me go ahead and dump this fluid and then uh, we'll reorient the camera and I'll take the rest of the crap out of there and you know, we'll see if there's more carnage. All right, let's take a uh, closer look at the Ford drum real quick, get everything out of here and then um, we'll get into the case. But uh, back here, I'll show you the apply for third gear for the 3-4 clutch pack. Good apply. I mean, technically the clutch would have worked, but with the amount of clearance that, that this thing has, you know, I don't know. I don't know why it was set up like this. You know, and like I said, I you know I wasn't there. Obviously, uh, any number of things you know could be could be a play here. I mean, I, I hate to bag on other builders. I know that's kind of a popular thing in YouTube um, when it comes to transmissions or auto repair in general. Um, you know, first thing that uh, whoever is filming, you know, the first thing they'll do is, you know, blame the builder. And in many cases, it's warranted, but, you know, I hesitate to do that unless it's a 100% crystal clear case of builder error. Um, you know, this case, I would say it's eh, I don't know. I would say it's like screwed up this three four pack, but the clutches aren't burnt. You know, it's not like they're smoked. Um, there's just a serious lubrication failure in this transmission that uh, caused you know, all that, you know, all that destruction to the gear train. Yeah, you know, we got a lot of heat in here, so there's definitely some slippage, and um, looks like the forward clutch suffered severely. So forward and coast clutch. Actually, the coast clutch, yeah, it looks, looks okay. The steel are fine. The bearing feels okay. I'll probably put a different bearing in here. The seal still feels supple, but you see, you see a little bit of signs of overheating here, you know, on the return spring. So look at the forwards, I mean, they are smoked. Smoked. Plate looks okay, but, I mean, you can see the discs are basically coned.
I mean, absolutely charbroiled. And then here is the side of the Coast Clutch Apply Plate or backing plate that faced the Ford Clutch Pack. So whenever you have a failure of the forward clutch pack, it's very, very critical that you find out exactly why that happened. Because three, four pack failure is you know, readily explainable by a multitude of things. But um, failure in the forward is very rare. Uh, if you tear down 100 Ford L60Es, you might get one transmission, maybe two or so, that look like this. I'd say no more than maximum of 10%. Um, and that's just based, again, on my, I guess, limited experience with these in 700 R4s. Um, I've done about maybe 3,000, a little bit of 3,000 of these in my life. But, you know, guys that have done 10 times that amount or more, um, you know, probably give you a, a little bit better representative uh, assessment of the overall population of these. But um, generally speaking, though, if you have a forward clutch failure like this, especially when the 3-4 pack doesn't look all that bad or, you know, um, coast clutch looks okay, it's just the forward clutch, um, then you need to find out exactly what went wrong and, and, and uh, you know, fix or replace whatever parts need to be fixed or replaced. Now, um, an integral part of that is air checking or pressure testing the drum. We just did that and there was no issues there, so our causes are elsewhere. Okay, so this looks like a replacement, uh, you know, 20 element Sprague assembly um, as per standard fare. So they did not go back with a used, you know, Sprague one way clutch, um, which is good, of course. This inner race appears to be okay. Let me get my rag and wipe it off a little bit. And the gear, sun gear looks okay. Um, I am curious as to why there's no uh, lube uh, lube channels, you know, cut into the face of the sun gear here for the forward. Um, there is for the rear sun gear. Generally, you want to, you know, if you're going to do that, uh, you know, lube mod, you want to do it to both the forward and the rear sun gear. So here is the uh, here's the inner diameter of the outer race. Okay, this got real toasty here on the hub. A little bit better lighting. Had to turn that overhead light on. Um, a little toasty here on the hub. So I have plenty of good used ones. This will not go back in. It's probably fine, but I'm not going to take a chance. Okay, here is your uh, Coast Clutch Hub. And real high horsepower applications, uh, these can break. So Sonics makes a billet steel um, Coast Clutch Hub that you can install. <clears throat> Anything real high performance. And then, of course, our Sprag, or, you know, never reuse that. All right, um, I'm gonna go take the snap ring out of here, and then we'll um, lay out all the, you know, all the parts. Um, a priori, I'm suspecting that forward piston housing is worn, and/or there's a lip seal issue on the sealing uh, surface for the forward apply piston. So, yeah, we'll see if I'm right or not. But uh, let me go ahead and uh, disassemble this and get all the parts, and then we'll take a closer look. All right, have the bench kind of cleaned up a little bit, and. We got the snap ring taken off, so here's our return spring assembly. Again, it got real overheated. I'll probably just put another one in here when I go back with it. All right, and one thing you can do is just check the sealing rings, and I'll bring the stator back in here too because we got to look at that. Um, this is going to be your forward clutch feed. This is coast clutch. 
So I don't know to what extent you could see these things, but let's see if I can get the camera to focus. What I'm looking for here are flat spots, um, lacerations, or anything else that would lead me to believe that, um, you know, this was the reason that that clutch pack failed. I mean, I rarely ever see that. Um, or if I do, the ring is straight up just, you know, cut, cut in half or whatever. But every once in a while, one will come in and have a flat spot on it for whatever reason. Uh, what usually happens is, you know, there's some sort of other failure somewhere else in transmission, maybe gear train, you know, some maybe some other part, you know, just broke apart and pieces of metal are circulating throughout the unit. And, you know, some of those pieces get in inside the stator bore and start cutting or otherwise damaging the ceiling rings. So it's like a secondary um, or tertiary failure. Uh, it's not the, you know, the root cause behind why the unit failed. It's just collateral damage. These ceiling rings look okay to me. Um, the other thing you'll notice is there's no check ball capsule here. Um, you have your converter feed uh, ball capsule. The 700R4s have what's called a single feed capsule. The 4L60Es have a dual feed. And when you take the capsule out, this basically allows converter charge for the clutch to just flow unimpeded, unmetered um, to that to that clutch applying it. And it can be, in some cases, it can actually be harmful for the clutch. So you know, you're gonna have to use judgment as to whether or not you wanna do this. Um, this is going to be a low stall application, so oops, so we're going to put um, you know a new uh, ball capsule in there. Um, this will be used for towing, but uh, you know the donor or you know the the customer knows not to tow in overdrive, so um, you know it'll be towing in direct. Uh, of course, the converter is locked in third gear as well, but having the ball capsule not in there is not necessary, um, especially given the loads he's towing with. And, you know, if he was racing, we would leave it out. All right, let me get everything out of here. All right, we'll take a quick cursory glance at the bottom. Yeah, I don't see any signs of damage. I don't, you know, again, just at a glance, I don't see uh, fractures or fissures or anything that would concern me structurally, you know, in this part of the drum in here at the very base. Appears to be okay. Um, I'll do my final inspection in the jet wash or after the jet wash, I should say. Okay, the lift seal. Um, both the inner and the outer lip sealing surface on the 3-4 uh, piston is supple. So, I mean, you saw the uh, apply, it was applying. Now, obviously, these get replaced on overhaul, but it's always good to, you know, check them, especially if you have any kind of failure that's unusual. We'll do that um, for the forward piston. So, number seven apply cage, it's pretty standard. All 4L60Es have a number seven. 700R4s from 1988 and um, you know and forward, they will have a number four apply plate. Although I've seen some that have an unmarked apply plate, which is the tallest of the three. The unmarked version went into all the first generation 700s and um, you know uh, 82 to early 87. All right, here's the 3-4 uh, return spring. Looks like it's got a little bit of surface rust on it. Um, yeah, this core was sitting in my yard for a little while, so you know, a little bit of moisture probably got in there. But it looks okay otherwise. All right, so here's the uh, forward piston housing, and here's the forward piston, and here's the coast clutch piston. All right, so coast clutch piston. Lip seal feels supple here. Okay, which you, you know, want to see if you're looking for damage or an explanation as to why something burnt up is... Um, you know, either tears, cracks, or um, a ceiling surface that's hardened in spots. Uh, I've taken some apart where, like, it's rock hard. All right, nothing was, uh, you know, nothing was sealing. So, and here is the inner surface. This is going to be a little bit tougher by nature, but it feels okay to me. You know, largely unremarkable. All right, so here's four piston housing. Let's take a look at it. Okay, we have a whole lot of sludge built up. And 
and uh, you know, some of that's not going to come out, at least not. Now we're just wiping it with a shop towel. I mean, that's the kind of sludge that you'll see. All right, so I'm going to actually clean this up because I, I want to check it. But when you go back with a, um, you know, a, a drum where the forward clutch was smoked like you saw here, uh, you really want to check all the surfaces and then you want to do an air check um, you know, with this thing once it's assembled. If you want to go that route, if you just want to replace this, which is what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace it regardless. But if you just want to straight away replace it and you install the replacement, um, irrespective of whether it's the original or the replacement, what you're looking for and listening for is faint hissing sounds coming from deep within inside this drum when you're putting air into that forward clutch apply feed port here on, on the shaft. And that's this one right here. So if you hear that, then you pretty much know that this forward piston housing is not sealing. You know, the piston is not sealing fully against the housing. And over time, you know, X amount of drive cycles, it's just simply going to uh, burn up. All right. So, again, we can't really tell definitively based on uh, a visual inspection with it filthy like this. I mean, for what it's worth, there's nothing like, super obvious that's, you know, sticking out. But, um, you know, once we get it cleaned up and, you know, maybe I'll reassemble it with this in there. Maybe I won't. But, you know. That's one of my um, lead suspects for what happened there with the forward clutch. All right, um, feeling the surface here. I'm gonna see if we wipe it off a little bit. See if we can see any any signs of uh, you know tearing or any chunks missing out of it. I mean, I don't see anything straight away at first glance. Let me get a, a different paper towel. Get a little cleaner. This does feel a little bit harder than they typically do. This side feels soft, but this side feels a little bit harder. The inner diameter of the seal feels okay. I mean, It doesn't feel new by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that feels like it's a little bit worn to me. So, it may be that this is, you know, this is the, um, the proximate cause of the failure there. But, like I said, unless you go through the, you know, take the time and go through to re clean this up completely, reinstall it, assemble the drum, you know, everything all clean and new parts and whatnot, and then you do your air check, I mean, then, then you'll know definitively. And I may do that depending upon what kind of time I have, but... Um, if you see forward clutch burn up like this, the default um, posture should be just to replace this along with obviously this, because chances are it is it's this, especially if you can't find anything here on the ceiling ring surface. And let me go grab the stator, you know, stator pump cover half, and we'll look inside the stator board to see if uh, there's any signs of wear, uh, any instances where the ceiling rings have cut grooves in the inner diameter of the stator. All right, I'll do my best to get you inside the board here so you can see. As I'm looking at it, I actually don't see 
any grooves cut in anywhere on this uh, on this stator board. Now I know my camera work sucks here. Uh, this viewing angle is not great, but. Yeah, the, the stator is healthy. Inner bore is fine. Um, yeah, the journal surfaces look fine. Bushing's worn, but not anything unusual. Working surface is a little scored up, but nothing major, I mean, Nothing that would lead you to believe something catastrophic occurred in the back of the gear train, or in the back of the transmission, rather, to the gear train. the center support out so that shaft's gonna have to go back in there let's take a quick look at it first make sure it's not all screwed up in some way so as you can see it's kind of chopped almost like a Corvette shaft um, the situation with this in terms of like the vehicle that it was installed in uh, was a, I think it's a Toyota um, Lane Cruiser or 4Runner or something like that and uh, it's using the Toyota um, either a Toyota transfer case or a, uh, an aftermarket transfer case but uh, it's a 4x4 application but it had to use a two-wheel drive output shaft because of a regular you know GM output shaft for the 4x4s is simply not long enough so All right, so we want to look at splines. We want to make sure that there's no damage to any of these splines that would lead us to believe that we should replace this shaft. And same with these splines and the journal surfaces. Again, this is filthy. It's got to be cleaned up. So you have a lot of dirt and crud and sludge in here. Uh, that may or may not be concealing issues, but at first, uh, you know, first glance, it looks reasonably okay to me. All right, let's get that uh, snap ring out of the way. I can zoom in here this what I'm about to show you is without a doubt on the builder look where that snap ring is relative to the anti-clunk spring okay you never want to install the um, snap ring so that one of the ends is overlapping the anti-clunk spring because that's a great way to have that thing just come out um, you know, there's a whole lot of stress and, uh, you know, torsional stress on uh, torque as this thing is operating and that the center support sees. And that anti-clunk spring is absorbing all of that um, so that there's no damage to anything else in the transmission. So it's going to deflect against the snap ring like that. I'm surprised it didn't pop out. Now, if you, I guess if you had to make this mistake, this is uh, the, you know, side of the clunk spring that you want to overlap. Um, the other one, it more than likely would have popped out if the snap ring was oriented, you know, the other way, such that this one, or this end rather, is overlapping that side of the spring. Uh, 
and hopefully I'm getting enough of this where you can see what's going on. All right, now I have to insert the output shaft back in here and hopefully nothing else is welded up in here because if so, then there might be problems getting the rest of this crap out. That would suck. Good news. All right. Our low reverse frictions, steels, and wave plate or cushion plate, and rain gear. So, we'll look at the clip pack in a second. You see that? Let me go get like a an actual, uh, actually good. Let me go get another one of these out of the drawer and we can compare and contrast. All right, so there's a snap ring here, and you know this half and this half are, you know, they're not like joined or anything other than being held together with the snap ring. So uh, the good news is this, you know, bottom part can easily be replaced. But yeah, that should not look like that. I mean, that I look that was machined. Now it felt like something sharp in here, and I'm like, what? What in the world? Why is that trying to cut me? That shouldn't be. So, so this will obviously have to be replaced. But I'm going to check your teeth. Make sure that they're okay. So that you can at least reuse the ring gear portion. And it looks like you see little pieces of, uh, you know, splines or whatever caught up in the teeth. I have a whole boatload of these. I'm probably just going to replace the entire assembly, you know, uh, you know, parking portion of the gear, the ring gear and the, um, you know, hub or reaction shaft or whatever you want to call it. All right, let's take a look at the planet. Maybe not right this second. There was a friggin' plane flying right over top my uh, my shop, but all right, you got a little bit of side play. This one didn't have any. This one does. This one's got side play. So this planet's no good. I mean, you could rebuild these to be clear. Um, if you have planet like that, 
if the you know housing itself is okay and maybe the bearings okay or you can get a hold of another bearing um, you know you can just punch out the pinions put new needle bearings or good used ones and you know reassemble it um, I'm not gonna bother with that right now you know for the purposes of this thing I'm gonna just put a different planet in there all right the only thing left is the low reverse um, you know piston and return spring assembly I'm not gonna film that I mean you know it's like any other uh, there was no issues with reverse in this transmission so anyway um, we have a pinless accumulator installed uh, Sonex on the fourth gear uh, we also have one installed for the one two so they did install pinless accumulators let me see if I can locate it a Corvette servo was installed Anyway, it's, it's, it's down here in this uh, tin can. So, Sonic's uh, 1, 2, and 3, 4 accumulator piston springs are the same. Uh, you can certainly install them. And then you have a factory style spring for the inner spring on the 1, 2 accumulator. And then you have the 1 2 accumulator. Now, in the 1 2 housing, you have this little buffer spring. Um, and that was installed facing the spacer plate. So the uh, Sonics pinless accumulators are designed specifically to limit the amount of accumulator fluid on the accumulation side of the piston. So how an accumulator works is there's a whole bunch of fluid um, that pulls on the accumulator side of the piston which slows the rate of overall apply and the speed of apply of whatever um, applied element you know you're talking about or whatever it's designed to um, you know soften whatever shift that it's designed to you know make a little bit longer in duration so that the transmission doesn't bang shift I mean that's really um, the whole idea behind accumulators is to ensure that the shift from the point of view of the driver is short but smooth and not overly harsh or violent so if you were to block off the one to accumulator in these transmissions um, and then let's just say further you would uh, install a giant superior tech servo you would have an extraordinarily violent shift unless you had something like a 6,000 stall converter or something like that so um, the logic behind the Sonics pistons is it shortens the amount of distance that piston has to travel therefore lessening the amount of volume of fluid that it has to overcome on the accumulation side so that the speed of the shift is increased it's hastened it's uh, quickened and for anything that's um, you know used in any kind of performance or heavy duty application that's exactly what you want within reason right within the, the you know the the confines of what is reasonable and prudent given uh, things like stall speed vehicle weight application and you know to a some extent uh, the driver's preferences so anyway um, uh, this is stuck in here I have to get it out um, normally this would go upside down and then you'd have the spring in he has it you know um, I guess this direction which is how a stock 4L60E accumulator piston is installed so um, and then the only other thing that I will mention that was kind of curious was the Sonics boost valve. So, um, a Transgo uh, or you know, some sort of aftermarket uh, spring was installed, and then, and this is the uh, this is the slide spring, not the pressure regulator spring. Rather, um, this is the little boost valve buffer spring. So this goes right here, like that and then you have the outer spring. Um, here's what I thought was interesting though. This is a late model, a late model 4L60E 
uh, boost valve kit. So you have a late model valve and you have a late model sleeve and you have a real stubby, um, you know, a real stubby uh, end tip right there, whatever, st uh, stem. Uh, installed was this little spacer over top of it. So it looked like this. You know, when you were looking at the, uh, uh, the pump cover face on, you know, with the boost valve facing you. And then the snap ring went over top here. So I thought that was kind of curious. Not seen it before, but like I said, I don't pretend to have seen seen it all. I mean, every time I think I do, I see something that I have not come across, and you know, I learn something. I mean, like I said, I've done a lot of 4L60Es, but um, almost invariably, anytime I tear one apart, I, I learn something new. So, anyway, that's the video. Thought it was interesting. Figured I'd you know show it to you guys. Um, you know, a lot of folks like to see carnage, and you know, we have plenty of that. Um, you can see, look at all the, the damage to the inner race here on the little roller. You know, I mean, look at that. That, that, that thing is just absolutely um, beat to death. All right, this is a new little roller assembly. This is, uh, you know, how they're making them. So the little rollers very rarely um, fail in these transmissions. Uh, so if you work on TH350s, you could drop this entire assembly with the uh, inner race and everything into a, you know, into a TH350, and you will address a serious um, area of weakness in that transmission because those um, low rollers are very thin, and the same applies to the very early 700R4s. They use the same clutch, and you know, they have a high failure rate. So if you're building TH350 or you got an 82 or to early 84 700R4 that you're working on, um, you want to retro a late 700 or 4L60E center support in there with the uh, wider low roller assembly and you know, you'll address that, that uh, problem proactively. All right, it's a couple days later and I have all the parts cleaned up, including all the damaged parts and Everything that you see on the bench, other than the valve body sitting in the corner there, is not going back in the transmission. Uh, you know, it was damaged or otherwise um, <clears throat> a soft part that we would replace anyway. But most of the parts you see on the bench are hard parts. In other words, we would not normally replace them during the course of a rebuild. So, in the case of this transmission, unfortunately, there's quite a lot of them uh, that will not be going back in. Uh, the sun shell is a soft part. The, the bonded piston is a soft part. They always get replaced. Um, but things like apply plates, the Ford piston housing, your hubs for your Ford Sprague assembly, the output shaft, the reaction shaft, and uh, the parts of the gear train center support are all things that... Uh, normally do not get replaced unless they're damaged and <clears throat> like i always say in my tear down inspections uh, you want to do your real um, inspection once parts are cleaned up and in most cases it's not necessary because it's obvious as to why something failed but in this case we had a forward clutch failure and we had a gear train failure and it's not immediately clear as to why that is so um, whenever you have a situation like that, you really need to do everything you can to figure out what caused the damage that you see in front of you and, you know, to all the parts that came out of the transmission you're working on. And, um, in order to do that effectively, or at least to make it a lot easier for you, um, it's important to clean up everything. Uh, that you can get all that old transmission fluid and sludge and grime and grit out of the way so that you can have a much cleaner and clearer view of things. So, <clears throat> so I'll kind of start with uh, um, the parts in terms of where they are in the case with the front of the case and then kind of work my way rearward as we go through and take a closer uh, look at each of these parts to see what um, they can tell us about this failure. So the forward and a, a coast clutch apply plate. <clears throat> this apply plate may or may not be reusable, but whenever I see a clutch that is completely smoked, completely burnt, 
like uh, you know what you saw earlier in the video, uh, I automatically put that apply plate aside or backing plate or pressure plate or whatever you want to call it. I don't ever reuse it um, because I'm not confident that it's you know still flat. <clears throat> um, if it's warped even ever so slightly, um, you know you may not even be able to visually see, but it's going to detrimentally affect the the clutch pack and it's going to fail prematurely. Um, so. I always put a good use replacement or a new one in, depending upon you know which part it is. In this case, I have you know I would say about a dozen um, extra 4L60E forward clutch backing plates or pressure plates. So I just you know I'm gonna roll with one of those good used ones. And same with the coast clutch. I mean, you see the amount of bluing here, and a lot of uh, the amount of heat soaking. All right. I don't recommend reusing anything that comes out of the transmission looking like this. Now, you can always machine these, but, <clears throat> and I'm not a metallurgist and I don't know for a fact if, you know, these are um, heat treated or, you know, there's any kind of um, integrity concerns or, you know, metallurgy concerns when you machine plates. There's usually not, and you can usually get away with machining them. The problem with that is, is if you have to machine too much, it can adversely affect your clearance. The coast clutch uh, clearance is regulated from the factory. There's no selectives. Um, there are slightly different uh, thicknesses of plates of this uh, forward clutch pressure plate. Uh, I don't know if that's officially in the literature or not, but I've noticed over the years some are a little thicker than others. Um, but you know these things are everywhere, and there's no sense in reusing. You know, taking a chance with a potentially warped plate if you can just reuse, you know, uh, swap it out. And then the wave plate, the cushion plate, um, <clears throat> these are always kind of subjected to a lot of heat and, you know, they're always constantly working. This one's probably fine to reuse despite its appearance, but again, I'm not going to take a chance. I don't want it like, you know, cracking on me and, you know, a thousand miles down the road or whatever. Um, you know, that would obviously cause a problem uh, and have the transmission have to come back. So, all right, so let's talk about the first failure and see what we can determine as far as what actually caused it. Now, earlier in the video, uh, I had talked about um, inspecting the sealing surface, right? Um, making sure that uh, you can, um, you know, get a good sense for whether or not uh, this sealing surface is still serviceable, still supple, and, you know, would have worked, uh, or if it was a little bit hardened, like this one is, but... <clears throat> this lip seal, um, at least the hardness of the lip seal is not the reason why that clutch failed and burned up like that. It's actually the forward piston housing. And although you couldn't tell when this thing was all, you know, uh, coated with transmission fluid and grime and sludge and whatnot, but if you look down here at the sealing surface real close, and I'll do the best I can to get this thing so that it focuses and you can kind of see what I'm talking about, this edge right here, and I'm not actually touching it because it's actually sharp to the touch. You could see that this edge was actually machined inside the transmission by one or more pieces of metal floating around that, you know, migrated into uh, this housing underneath the forward piston itself and started to machine the housing as the drum was rotating at, you know, however many thousands of RPM. <clears throat> and you can see here, there's a very, very sharp um, ledge cut into the ceiling surface. All right. Now you compare that with an otherwise good used piston housing and you can see that the ceiling surface is beveled and it's nice and smooth. There are no sharp edges anywhere. So yeah, I have no problem putting my finger there. So as this thing was working inside the transmission and rotating, pieces of metal were actually machining, uh, you know, little bits and pieces or sections off of the ceiling surface here and that's why some of it feels supple and some parts of it 
you know, feel hard because some of it was actually cut off. You know, it was like almost like it was turned. So when you had this clutch come on, when you know driver put the thing in either drive D3, two or manual low, forward clutch is always applied. Um, <clears throat> you were getting serious blow by, and this piston was probably cocking sideways, and then eventually it just simply stopped applying altogether. But at that point, the clutch had already burned up. All right, this fits the evidence because, um, you know, if we take a look at the ceiling rings on the input drum, hey, none of the ceiling rings are damaged. So if we had damage to either one of these ceiling rings, you would see the adjacent clutch also burnt up, right? You'd see the three four smoked if this ceiling ring was bad. You would also see uh, the coast clutch frictions burn up if this ceiling ring was bad because you'd have leaks uh, in either of these two locations. So that, that didn't happen. We didn't see those clutches burn up. You know, whatever caused the failure was confined to the forward clutch circuit and it, you know, it didn't involve ceiling rings. So, you know, the only place left that we can <clears throat> really consider for that is the forward piston housing. So. That's what happened, at least insofar as the forward clutch is concerned. But the forward clutch is really collateral damage. Okay, The failure didn't start in the forward clutch. It started back here in the gear train. And specifically with uh, this hub, the sun gear, and the sun shell. And you know, in this general area, the output shaft and migrated or you know propagated to the rest of the gear train front and rear okay the pump i just have it here on the bench because we're swapping in another machined pump body this pump body needs to be um milled out 10 thou but the pump did not play any role in causing this failure at least i don't believe it did i measured the clearance of the rotor and the slide that came out of there and although they're a little on the looser side uh, i want to say it was two and a half thou for the the slide and the rotor that by itself is not going to cause you know what you see here all right now keeping in mind all the bearings these are the bearings that came out of the transmission um they're all intact i'm not going to reuse any of them uh this is the selective washer uh even this got a little you know a little fudged uh it's fine i mean you know if there's sharpers or whatever i can you know get rid of those but uh, all the rest of these bearings <clears throat> took a beating. And while they feel fine to me, you can see this one was subjected to some heat. You see the heat there? Okay, you don't ever want to reuse bearings uh, when you have this kind of a, a failure in any transmission because you don't know if they're like on their last legs and, you know, they feel fine, they check good now, but you put them back in, you know, I don't know, 500 miles down the road, they come apart and... You know, you're back doing this all over again. All right, this race. Um, it's a shame. The inner diameter actually looks pretty good. Um, the outer portion just saw a ton of heat. Okay, a ton of heat. And there might have been some, uh, you know, as, as parts were violently uh, traveling longitudinally back and forth, there may have been some impacts here. I don't actually see anything. Um, the lugs are in decent shape. You know, you always want to check for, um, you know, any kind of excessive scoring to where it's catching your fingernail when you drag it up and down across each lug. But again, because of the amount of heat that this thing saw, I don't want to put it back in. And that, you know, same goes for the Coast Clutch Hub. I don't want to put it back in for, for that reason. Uh, otherwise, it looks okay. All right, output shaft. So earlier I mentioned when we were looking at it, you know, before I cleaned it off, uh, I thought I could reuse it. Um, I thought it, you know, apart from this, which was done on purpose, I mean, you know, to fit the application, I actually didn't see anything that concerned me with the splines or the journals, at least not at first. But once I cleaned it off and after closer inspection of this area right up in here, 
I realize that I really don't want to use this uh, shaft again because you see the pitting here. It looks superficial to me to the extent that I might have been able to get away with cleaning it up with some sandpaper, but unfortunately it's a lot deeper. And this area seals on that Viton seal between the input shaft and output shaft junction. And <clears throat> if this is making contact with the sealing surface on that uh, you know little seal there, then it's eventually gonna cut it. It's gonna wear, it's gonna cut it. And then um, if that seal fails to seal, then your lube circuit's gonna have a major leak in it and you're gonna have another gear train failure. And for all we know, um, this may have been the genesis of the entire event. I mean, it may have started here. Okay, I don't know that. Um, I'm speculating. All right. So as far as the shell or the sun gear, the reaction shaft. I mean, you can see. Look at all the heat that this thing sustained down there in the inner diameter and in the inner bore. And then of course you have the quote unquote machining or turning. Okay, I mean look at all this, all these parts violently um, interacting with each other. Okay, this thrust washer, I'm surprised it's still in one piece. Alright, um, you can see here uh, the teeth, you know, on the uh, outer diameter where this will engage your ring gear are actually in pretty good shape. But the rest of this is just grotesque. Um, of course, same with your sun shell and your sun gear. I mean, look at that. All right, this is a factory spec shell. Uh, I I don't know why the um, the transmission builder that built this last put this shell in here. Uh, it doesn't appear to be a heat treated version. It just appears to be a either a factory spec replacement shell or the original sun shell um, that came with the transmission from the factory. And you never ever reuse sun shells in 700R4s, 4L60Es. They are a soft part despite the fact they're made of metal. Uh, they wear, the neck will separate from the body here, the splines will strip and you'll have no reverse second and fourth if and when that happens. And their lifespans are about the equivalent lifespan of most of the soft parts in, in these units. So after about 150,000 miles, they're done. Um, you know, so whenever one comes in, you always put a new shell, uh, you know, when you go back for reassembly, you never ever reuse the old shell. And um, this looks to me like a factory shell. Um, all of the heat, you know, the, the heat soaking pattern you see here, this is from the event. This is not like from a, as part of a factory heat treatment process for this thing. So, you know, a, a big giant mess. And, um, you know, we'll get to speculating on like what truly caused this mess in a minute. And here you have the center support. All right, it's pretty obvious that the, uh, the inner race is no good. I mean, look at it. It got beat to death. Okay. But the support itself, at first glance, looked okay. All right. It looked okay until I took a closer look at the apply surface here on the underside of it, you know, that sees frictions. And you'll notice here a scoring line. Okay, that kind of bifurcates the outer two thirds of the apply surface and the inner one third. Okay, this does not exist, or at least it shouldn't exist. So that means metal got in here and again, rotating at however many thousands of RPMs, literally turned this portion of the apply surface, shrinking the amount of surface area that this has for the low reverse uh, top friction by yeah, roughly 30%. The rest of it looks okay, but this is no good. And, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend machining this in any way to try to save it because then you're playing with the clearances for the low reverse pack, which otherwise are not, um, you know, they're not 
adjustable. They're kind of designed in from the factory. There's no selectives. You just install the clutch pack and you install the wave plate if it takes one in the case of the uh, 88 and up 700 R4s and all four L60Es and you install your center support, you lock it, lock it down with your snap ring and that's it. You know, you just air check the pack and as long as it's good, then you're good. You know, and move on. All right, we have the um, uh, the output hub or reaction shaft. Okay, again, we got a machined intersection here, which <laughs> you know obviously don't come like that, so um, that clearly needs to be replaced. And then we have a bad planet. Okay, so a couple of these pinions are loose, or these uh, pinion gears or needle bearings are no longer any good. And <clears throat> you also have some damage here, which was not as obvious on inspection, or at least on initial inspection. You have some pitting, and you have some more scoring. Okay, this is uh, you know metal literally turning the inside or this you know face here by you know some tiny amount. All right, you got some you know some damage up in here. Okay, this whole thing is scrap metal. I, you know, I would never reuse it. I mean. You know, maybe you could take uh, the pinions out and, you know, maybe these gears are okay. You can salvage them and reuse them to rebuild other planets that have good housings. But as far as using that planet again as it is, you know, or even trying to rehabilitate it, I would not recommend it. So, anyway, um, you know, let's kind of uh, close the loop and see if we can figure out what actually happened here. Because if, I'm reasonably confident that the, uh, you know, the initial point of failure was, you know, with those parts and, and the output shaft. And then whatever happened every, you know, in terms of uh, subsequent, you know, collateral damage and, you know, secondary tertiary effects, you know, the forward clutch failure and all that was triggered as a result of whatever happened here. Um, you know, a couple possibilities include uh, a case that was assembled far too tight. So if you know, you're building a transmission and <clears throat> the transmission has an end plate spec, which in, in the case of automatic transmissions, you're almost always going to have that. Um, you know, you're never going to have uh, what we call an interference fit. In other words, where you have a preload condition you know, with the components inside relative to the case, like you would say a manual transmission. Uh, automatic transmissions almost always have some sort of built-in travel uh, or spacing between different groups of parts so that they can move and expand and contract and, you know, kind of live inside the case without, you know, beating each other to death like what you see here. So one possibility is that the, the case was assembled too tight and went back in and as a result, parts could not move freely, you know, travel longitudinally and create space for themselves to move and to spin and rotate and all that good stuff. So he just started to build and build and build and concentrated in that area, causing a meltdown between the sun gear and uh, the reaction shaft, which then of course spread to the rest of the gear train. Metal started circulating throughout the transmission, uh, took out the forward clutch, probably, um, you know, grenaded the converter. I mean, I, I have no idea what that looks like inside. You know, my, my builder will let me know uh, once I go pick up the new converter. But um, uh, there wasn't a lot of metal in uh, the pump or, you know, or there wasn't a lot of signs of metal passing, uh, you know, between the rotor and the slide and the two working surfaces, which is kind of surprising to me. Maybe the, f the filter did a great job of uh, collecting all of it, but um, bottom line is you had a lot of metal circulating throughout the barrel of the case. So that's one possibility. Um, I, for the life of me, you know, I, I don't know as a builder, how do you miss that though? Like when you check for your end play and you realize you have no end play, like how do you just say, okay, that's fine, you, know, you can go back in. Um, you know, or just simply miss it all together unless this was slapped together on a Friday afternoon, you know, a uh, guy was uh, just finishing it up literally two minutes before five o'clock, beer was calling, you know, uh, he had had enough and that was it, and, you know, it was going to go out the door like that. I don't know, that's just me theorizing um, and, and I'm probably wrong. 
I don't see how an even halfway competent builder can make that mistake. Another possibility is lubrication failure, just simply restrictions in the system causing uh, insufficient lube to the gear train. Um, that restriction can come in the form of you know, debris and crud in either the internal transmission cooler, the one that's inside the radiator, and or an external cooler, and or lines, or all of them. Um, so, uh, whenever I see something like that, I usually see the entire back of the gear train completely destroyed. I mean, even worse than this, like uh, the rear plant, all right, this would be like melted. Um, you would have the sun gear and this and the ring gear all kind of either welded together or melted together in in the form of just total destruction. And of course, the symptoms that the driver would experience would be either no movement whatsoever or perhaps a loss of reverse second and fourth mimicking a sun shell failure. So I don't think that happened here. I mean, this thing had 20,000 miles on it when it failed. So uh, 20,000 miles on the rebuild. So it, it, while it's possible, I don't think that that is ultimately what happened. Um, another possibility is simply running it low on fluid. Uh, insufficient fluid will basically have the same effect, but to varying degrees. If the fluid is low, but it's you know not so low that it you know uh, the transmission can't operate at all, then you could have a failure that looks like this. But I would be I would be inclined to think the three four pack would have been smoked. So that's the most vulnerable clutch pack in here. Uh, you're in these transmissions rather and whenever you have insufficient fluid you will have flare shifting delayed engagements um, you know uh, three four slippage and if the fluid is just right on the edge of being acceptable you may only experience a slight three four flare um, assuming that the otherwise the transmission is either put together correctly or you know otherwise healthy just low in fluid I don't see that here I only see uh, four clutch destroyed, you know, smoked. So uh, those are my working theories, though. Those are at least the ones that come to mind. Um, if you have uh, a, a theory or if you know, if you've seen this before, something very, very similar to this with the same kind of, um, you know, fact pattern, evidence pattern, and, uh, you know, you, you think you know what the cause was, please go ahead, post it in the comments. I'd be eager to hear, um, you know, what you think and, and your, uh, your reasoning. So anyway, that is the video. Uh, I'll be doing more autopsies and, um, you know, for other transmissions so that we can kind of, you know, build a body of case studies and, 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 you know, failure modes that we can then, um, you know, look over and scrutinize and have for reference uh, for future and or like kind situations. So as always, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or you want to see something specific, go ahead and leave them below. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. It's always um, great to have you on the channel. I appreciate all your viewership and I will be doing more videos for you. Thanks so much.